So I'm Brian DeShong. I'm the uh, director of backend development for CrowdTwist. Tonight we're talking about uh, my personal top 10 list of web and PHP application performance techniques, things I've learned over the years. This is the, uh, the theme for the Dave Letterman show, because we're going to kind of take that sort of approach with this. You'll see. So uh, again, I'm director of backend development for CrowdTwist. CrowdTwist is uh, essentially um, a customer relationship and loyalty management platform uh, that lets you recognize and reward all the people that touch your brand, be it online or offline. We work with a lot of big names, people like the Miami Dolphins, Sony Music, uh, um, among a handful. Uh, in former lives, I worked for Half Off Depot here in Atlanta, uh, previously for Yahoo, also here in Atlanta, uh, for an interactive agency, which is now known as Possible Worldwide, uh, and, and even farther back for a, a social network by the name of Community Connect. So I've been kind of doing this for a while, and I think that'll come out in my talk tonight. Uh, all told, I've got about 14 years of experience in the industry, about 12 of those as a developer. Uh, largely PHP and open source tools, um, always Linux, Apache, MySQL, a bit of Oracle here and there. More recently, some Redis, some MongoDB. So I've, I've kind of done it all and seen it all over the last decade plus. So I, that's kind of the things we're talking about tonight. I've also been dabbling in Mac and iOS development in my probably the last three years or so just kind of on the side, doing something completely different from, from PHP and the web. So that's kind of an up and coming thing for me. So tonight's show, as we'll call it that. Again, I've been doing this a long time. So tonight we're talking about all the kind of tricks and tips and things I've amassed over the years uh, in building relatively highly traffic scalable web applications. Um, some of these will be PHP specific, some of them won't be, they'll apply to a Java, a Ruby, a Python, whatever your, whatever your language preference is. So there's a bit of PHP and a bit of more general stuff. Uh, and there will be some special guest stars. I will not be doing all of the talking tonight. Uh, we will kick that off with number 10. So here we have Elizabeth Naramore. She's an event handler at GitHub. And she's going to introduce item number 10 on the top 10 list. Tweak your real path cache settings. So this is a PHP specific one, but this is uh, tweak your real path cache settings. How many of you have ever tweaked your real path cache settings in PHP? Um, okay, so how, ma how many of you know what the real path cache setting is in PHP? So a handful, okay. Probably those same people that have tweaked it. All right. It's hard for me to see my notes, by the way. But that's okay. Um, so what is the real path cache in PHP? Essentially, it's, uh, it's a mapping of, I'm going to require once foo slash bar dot PHP. It's a mapping that says, hey, PHP, that file really lives at home, dub, 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 lib, foo slash bar dot php. And we'll look at the details of this in a second, but whenever you touch something that resolves to a real path on the file system, uh, be it with the require once, I believe it also applies for file-based functions like file get contents and so on, PHP will now cache that mapping of a relative path to an absolute path where to get that file from. Um, so there's really two settings behind this in PHP. There are real path cache size, which is defaulted to 16 kilobytes and real path cache PTL, which is defaulted to 120 seconds. What that essentially says is uh, PHP will hang on to 16 kilobytes of memory for that whole mapping of files to full paths. Uh, those are the default values. And it will hang on to each of those mappings for 120 seconds. So in my experience, we have a relatively large application at, at CrowdTwist. I've actually honestly never touched these settings until maybe three or four months ago. So these are relatively new to me. Uh, We'll talk about how you can kind of find out if your value is too low, if you need to increase it. Um, so let's look at some specifics. It's probably a little bit hard to read. It's kind of off-center, actually, um, but that's OK. Um, so here I've run a command called strace. How many of you are familiar with strace in Linux? OK. So strace basically says, attach on to this process, in this case an Apache web server process, and tell me what it's doing. So literally, back in the fall, my boss, Mike Montero, hi, Mike said, hey, Brian, I see all these LSTAT calls and these strace outputs uh, in production. What's going on? So this is kind of hard to see here, but strace shows you all the C function calls being made under the hood. So this is actually a list of, I've, uh, I require once, this is using slim, I require once for slim slash slim.php, which with my real cache setting too low or you know, turned off, um, it has to make all these function calls to figure out where that file actually exists 
um, on disk and it begins to sort out, okay, it crawls up the directory tree and figures out what's a symlink, what's a directory and so on. So there's a whole bunch of stuff it actually does under the hood if you look at an S trace. So all this stuff in here is usually not good. You don't want to take the hit of doing those things in a production application. So uh, once the real path cache, this is the first request. The first request that came in where I require once this file. And this is all my subsequent requests. So all those LSAT calls over here on the left are gone. They're not happening anymore. They only happen once and uh, the resulting, you know, the absolute path is cached. So here we see that I require one slim, slim.php, and here is the full path to it. So I've avoided all this garbage in the middle. So therefore, my subsequent requests are a little bit kind of faster and leaner. Um, how do you know it's low and how do you adjust it? There's a function in PHP called real path cache size, which gives you back the current number of bytes of memory you're using for that chunk of real path cache. So in my case, when I was faced with this in the fall, I ran this function and I saw that I was hitting the default 16 kilobyte limit. So that tells me, oh, well, 16 kilobytes isn't enough. So we began kind of cranking it up, doubling it, tripling it. We ended up somewhere pretty far north of 16 kilobytes. Um, but if you call this function and its value is close to that 16 kilobyte default value, you need to crank up your real path cache. This is usually something you'll be doing with um, a big application, something like uh, a Kazen framework where you're including a lot of files, you know, require once again a bunch of files during the request lifecycle. So point is, if you see this value and it's close to the, the actual limit, you probably need to increase it, double it, triple it, test it again, see where you end up. Um, also, back on the TTL, if your files don't, if their paths don't change, which of course they never would in production, you know, you've got a file and it sits on disk and that's where it stays, um, you can crank up that TTL time too so that PHP will hang on to that mapping of, you know, full file path and hang on to it for an hour or a day or some long length of time so that you don't have to go back to disk and figure out where it actually lives later on. So crank these up in production, figure out what makes sense and test it, test it, test it and get it where it needs to be and, uh, and leave it there. Couple quick caveats on this one. So the cache is maintained per process. So the number of Apache processes you have running times the size of the cache equals the total footprint of the real path cache. If you've got a low memory machine, you just kind of need to be mindful of not running out of memory. Um, so this is one of those things you just have to tweak it and see where you end up. Um, and again, I've never had to touch this tool a few months ago. So any questions on that quickly? No? Go ahead, make it quick. It's not really about users. So I think your question was how many users are you talking about so you have to adjust it? It's, well, we probably could have changed it many months before. We just had never looked into it. We had never actually run strace and seen what was going on. And when we did, the occurrence of all those LSAT calls was a red flag that we're going to disk way too often. So we began to tweak those settings. Does that answer your question? It's really like if you've got a big application, which we do at CrowdTwist, we needed to crank it up. If you're using an auto loader, if you're using like a slim PHP or little parts of Zen framework, you're not, it's 16 kilobytes is enough for you. Um, probably, so sorry. So Jason asked, if your auto loader resolves to absolute paths, will this help you? No. So in that case, all your required once's would be for absolute paths, probably wouldn't help you at all. If you ran that real path cache size function, you're probably looking at a couple kilobytes, maybe at the most. So, it's it's a shared pool of memory for that entire Apache process. Sorry, repeat the question. Uh, if you've got multiple websites running on a server, that's a good question. Um, how do they how do they share it? Do you need to? Yeah. They're each going to map to a different base, yeah. How does it distinguish the hey, you know, not Well, wouldn't they, I mean, presumably foo slash bar dot PHP would be the same foo slash bar dot PHP in both uh, your applications? Um, for example, you're running two different groups of sites. Yeah. About the HP. Right. You've, you've, got, you've got the code base duplicated in both of them. Yeah. So you use a relative in one, you can have the same relative there, but they're going to actually resolve the two different Okay, I follow. I just went through it in my mind. So presumably you're in, so, repeating the question. You've got two websites, different, different base paths of where all the code lives for them, right? So 
Generally speaking, you would have a different include path for website A and a different include path for website B. Therefore, my understanding is that website A would resolve foo slash bar dot PHP relative to its include path, and website B would resolve to a different include path. That may not, not actually be true. I guess I would argue that you should really be centralizing that code if you can and reusing it, not duplicating it. That's the real fix. But admittedly, I don't know the full answer to that question. I may not install Drupal to let you know that. I'll just be completely honest. So, um, Sorry for that half answer. So that's number 10. I'm 10 minutes in. This is not good. Uh, number, no more questions. No more questions. Number nine. This is uh, Scott Rocher, CTO of Tongs Coffee. Whenever possible, use offline processing. That's the best audio out of all of them, by the way. Nice job, Scott. Whenever possible, use offline processing. Uh, this gets into things like Basically, when you're doing something that's expensive or long running, you don't want to do it. So you don't want to do it with your web server process. So imagine a uh, user uploads an image, big, huge, you know, five megabyte JPEG, and you want to generate a bunch of thumbnails of it. You don't want to generate all those thumbnails in that process when the user just uploaded the image. You don't want to say, I got a five meg image, generate five other thumbnails. Don't do that in the web server process mainly because it uses a lot of memory, it's CPU intensive, the user's sitting there waiting while your server's chugging along, crunching through thumbnails. Um, that's one use case. Other things are like video, um, talking to third party APIs, basically anything that's gonna take a, while, uh, take a while or be resource intensive or potentially fail, you wanna try to offload it and do it with some backend job. So how would you run a backend job like that? Um, oh, sorry, that's the next slide. Uh, this is really about keeping the response time for the user low. So their perceived time to when they upload their image to when they can move on and keep using the application is lower because you've got some other server off somewhere else crunching through those thumbnails. Um, so how to run them. How many of you run crontab, cronjobs? It's pretty common, right? Um, so that's the most common kind of you know, easy way to, to get into this. You would write some job that says, hey, I've got some image in a directory, generate a bunch of thumbnails. Um, so generally you can run these CLI scripts out of something like CronTab. Um, another option is using Gearman or Messaging Queue. If you saw Brian Moon's talk back in the fall, he spoke all about Gearman. Uh, the guy is a complete genius when it comes to Gearman. Um, so there's kind of a lot more modern things above and beyond just writing CLI scripts at this point uh, that give you really good options for how to process these things. Um, think about it. When you upload a video to YouTube, a, you know, 15 minute video, right? YouTube starts crunching that video and transcoding it off in the background. You can keep going on and using YouTube, right? So they've implemented offline processing of all those video cues as you upload video. Um, but really, just you know, make that expensive work. Make it be done concurrently. Get it away from the user and out of the web server. Any questions on that? Kind of breezing through number eight or number nine there. Sorry. Um, number eight, Matthew Turlin from Cinecore. Write efficient SQL queries. Matthew's audio is not that great. So this is write efficient SQL queries. Uh, easily one of the most important ones in this whole talk. Um, know your database queries. Your database will always be far and away your biggest bottleneck in an application. You, you, no, I gave him a list. I was like, hey, say this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is very well planned, yeah. Um, uh, you as a developer, you want to know what your queries are doing when they retrieve data. You want to know, am I hitting indexes? Am I full table scanning a database table? You really only want to select out the values you need. How many of you actively write a database query and think to yourself, what is this doing? Is it really efficient? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hands. That's roughly like 30% of this room. So the other 70% of you need to get home and tune your SQL queries. Uh, and we'll talk about how. Um, so how can you optimize them? Um, I think I have slides in here on this. Ah, I just totally went backwards. Right efficient SQL Sorry. queries. Sorry. Matthew got double uh, shows there. All right, so um, this is a totally contrived example, but I built out a table in MySQL called Booked. In it, there's an ID, a title, and an author, right? Dead simple. There's only two rows in it. So normally I would say select ID, title, author from book where my author is Tina Fey. I just read that book in the fall. I probably shouldn't say that on camera, but I did. It was good. Um, uh, so in MySQL and in most databases, 
uh, there's a keyword called explain. So you can say, here's a query, run an explain plan on it. So in this case, what does it show it? It shows us we've gone to our book table. We're not using any keys or any indexes on that table to get that data back for that query. And we're scanning two rows in the table. In this case, this is all the rows in the table. But this is bad. If you run explain in some select query and you see no, 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 huge red flag. You're full table scanning your table. When your table grows to be a million, five million, 160 million rows, like you're in real trouble. So if you've got select queries you've written and you don't know if they're using indexes and keys, go home and figure it out. Like that's the best thing you can do for your application, hands down. So let's optimize this whole process and step through it. So I'm going to put an index on that book table on the author column. This is not normalized, it's kind of simple author data model, book data model, but I'm going to say, hey book table, index yourself on author. So when I run this query again, you'll see that it's much more efficient. So now I say explain, grab all the values from book where the author is Tina Fey. Now what's different here? Now we're using some indexes. We're using that author index I just added to the table, right? We're only scanning one row in the table. So imagine if this table had 20,000 books in it. Before the index, you would have looked at 20,000 rows to find all the ones where the author matches. Whereas now you're only using that index and you're saying, hey, there's one row that matches my author query. So this query is leaps and bounds more efficient. Um, in a high traffic, high scalability world, query performance and tuning, ridiculously important. That's number eight. Any questions? All right, number seven. This is uh, Scott Lively, who could not be here uh, tonight from Solo Health. Easily the best video of all of them, all of them by the way. Don't execute queries in loops. Because that would be like Fruit Loops, man. I, I wanted to cut it out. I wanted to cut it out, but he did such a good job of being funny about it. So thank you, Scott. Too bad you couldn't be here. Uh, kind of dovetails with the last one. Don't run queries in loops. I've seen so many developers, and I've done it myself, who run database queries in loops. Bad, bad news. Huge red flag. So if you've got some function or some method that says select some stuff from a table, and then you're later going into some for loop or a while loop or whatever the case may be, and you're calling that function, huge red flag. Like, you need to fix that kind of stuff. And we'll look at in a little bit how you can identify those areas and fix them. Um, but it's easy now with ORMs and all this kind of stuff to just say, oh, I want some data, give it to me in a loop. Like, and you just don't think about it. Like, my argument is you need to think about it. You need to treat your database nicely. Be nice to it. It's your biggest bottleneck. So you need to kind of approach it with caution. Don't take it for granted. Um, if you must run queries in a loop, um, this is getting into security stuff, but prepare your query once, bind all your values to it, and execute it in the loop if you need to. I would argue that's still really bad. Um, I think we look at some other options in a minute. So really another contrived example, this is a class called Data Manager. And on it I have a method called getThingData where I pass a thing. I totally just wrote this in the slide. I did not, this is not real code. Um, and I say, select ID, name, and color from my thing table where my ID is whatever the thing ID is, right? Relatively simple, benign, kind of no, you know, no concerns with this function, this method, standalone, right? But when you stick it in a for each loop and you have 50 things you want to get all their data for, you're running that query 50 times now, right? Bad, bad news. Again, kind of contrived example, but my point is it's really easy just to forget about hey, I'm getting some data from my database and just abuse it to no end. Don't do that. It's really bad. So be mindful of when you're going to get data from your database that you're not abusing it, that you're being a good steward to your database. It's easy to miss. So, you know, how many of you actually write your queries from hand, like by hand nowadays? Wow, very, very few of you. Probably that same roughly 30%. The rest of you use like query builders and table builder type stuff, I'm assuming. Anyone using the doctrine? Okay, all right, so a handful of that stuff. Okay. I'm old school, I still write my queries, what can I say? Um, but use your head, catch this stuff early. If you absolutely have to deal with many records, so we do a lot of things at CrowdTwist and, and other places I've been where if you want to get a whole bunch of rows back for, let's say, 20 IDs, you pass the 20 IDs to the function or to the method and run a query you know, with an in clause in it or whatever the case may be, and just go to your database once for all those 20 things don't go, it to it, don't go to it 20 times for each one, once at a time. So easy to miss this, but be mindful of it. Think about it when you're hitting your database. It's really important. Any questions? All right. Just stop me if you have questions. I'm not going to ask anymore. Uh, number six, 
Uh, we have a double header on this one. Uh, first up, Maggie Nelson, and then Jed Lau from Findery. No, what your application is doing. Sorry, low audio. Know what your application is doing. Know what your application is doing. Kind of a fuzzy, kind of, you know, vague sort of uh, topic, but let's dive into it a little bit. Know what your application is doing. So it's really important that as you serve a request for a user, right, they're going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, I'm going to log in, I'm going to hit the home page of your site, whatever it is. You want to know what's happening on that home page. It's ridiculously important to know when you're going to the database, when you're going to cache, and what you're doing to give that user back their response. So you need to keep tabs on things like what database queries are you running? What are you going to memcached for, let's say? Um, you know, what's in the current session for that user? Uh, or I guess if you're using cookies, it doesn't apply. But you know, what are some system stats around this? We're going to look at some concrete examples. Uh, one of the tools, how many of you have ever used Fire PHP? How many of you use Firebug in Firefox? All right, so more. So Fire PHP is a, basically a layer on top of Firebug in Firefox. It's, it's actually been ported to Chrome. It's not quite as pretty, but um, it's basically a, a console logging tool for, um, uh, that you can call from PHP where in PHP, it's gonna, the, the PHP class they distribute basically sets a bunch of headers in the response. It's all serialized PHP data. But you can arbitrarily say, while you're rendering that home page, hey, log an info message, log a warning, log an error. So you can just kind of output console messages. But you can also organize data in tables, just arbitrary sets of you know, tabular data. And we'll look at that in a second. Um, in Zen Framework, how many of you use Zen Framework? OK, a handful. Less than I would have expected. Um, in Zen Framework 1, there's a module called Zen DB Profiler Fire PHP which will automatically, if you use it, output all the data about all your queries that are running into Fire PHP. So you can render a page and see all the queries that ran on it. Zen Framework 2 has Zen Log Writer Fire PHP. So you could use that if you're using the more modern Zen Framework 2. Kind of, still kind of abstract, right? Let's look at it in concrete terms. So I usually tend to use Fire PHP and kind of customize it so that it gives me useful information about the page that's running right in front of my face. So this is kind of small, sorry. This is actually the home page of one of our sites. Uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but down here, this is, um, my, I opened up my Firebug in Firefox, and you see there's a table of data here. So it shows the, the URL that was hit, and it shows you a couple things. We'll look at them closely in a second. But in this case, it shows me the database queries I ran, um, how many memcached operations I ran, my current user data, and some basic system stats. And it shows you that for every page you know, that, it, that renders, you know, so in this case, the home page and then some Ajax call down below. Fire PHP renders all that data in the response headers, so it's really non-intrusive. Let's look at these more closely. So if I click on basic data in my case, I'm printing out to Fire PHP, my current peak memory usage, my Apache process ID, just useful stuff that if I needed to debug something or find some crazy runaway memory usage type page, I would see it right here in front of my face. Um, if I click on my memcached operation, so I've gone to memcached to get uh, for 15, I've gone to memcached 15 times, uh, and we see just a quick snapshot of uh, I did a get for this particular key, and it gave me a value back of this particular array. So I, as a developer, or I, as someone who's auditing that code, can quickly see hey, you know, Joe Schmo developer just built this page, but hey, he's clobbering the database with 15 queries or with 50,000 cache gets. Um, sorry, it's a little small here too, but this is one of the queries that was run on this page. It's the full text of the query, um, all the values I've bound to it in an array, and the execution time of that query. So you can look at this and see, hey, I've got some query on my page that runs three or five seconds, right? Fire PHP to me personally is really about, it's a tool for putting information about what's happening during a request in front of the developer's face so that you don't go to production with 60 queries on your home page, and then it's a fire drill, right? You want to catch all that stuff up front. So using tools like Fire PHP is really, you know, it's meant to aid, aid in that pursuit. There are some other options. How many of you have used Xdebug? Okay, good handful of you, good. So Xdebug is common for profiling and tracing of PHP code. Um, how many of you have used XHProf? No one with XHProf, a couple with XHProf, okay. So these Xdebug and XHProf are tools for 
profiling what happens during a PHP request. They'll, they'll typically dump out a file to disk that shows you all the functions that were called, how long they took, how much memory they used, and so on. Um, so those are two really great tools. They're both available as PHP extensions. There's also XHGUI, which is a graphical interface, like a web-based thing, uh, that can read the profiler file or, uh, profile or output files from XHProc. Any questions on that one? Kind of breezing through that one, sorry. All right, number five. Uh, our own Robert Swarthout from Shoe Proof, number five. Use gzip compression on responses. Use gzip compression on responses. Uh, how many of you know what this even means? Good, a good handful of you. So how many of you are familiar with mod deflate in Apache? How many of you are running Apache? How many of you are running Nginx? Nobody? What are the rest of you running? Are you even running websites? What are you doing here? Um, so this one's dead simple. Uh, when you build up the response to a user, like let's say you're rendering a page, out of the box, Apache and Nginx and company will just send back the raw HTML, plain text, you know, all of it right there. This is really about compressing that response before you send it out because a lot of modern browsers, really all of them nowadays, support it. So before I send back, the server will, before it sends back a chunk of HTML, essentially zip it up and then send it back to the user. So you're sending a lot less data over the wire back to the user that they can use to actually render the response in their browser. This saves you a, a ton of bandwidth. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, think about it. If you zip up a text file, right, you get like an 85 plus compression ratio on that text file. I mean, you're saving yourself literally 70 plus percent of bandwidth going out of your servers back to your users. So it ends up your user has less data to pull down over the wire. Your servers are spending less time. Uh, they're, they're sending out less data so your bill is lower. Um, this is a no-brainer. Gzip your responses. So how do you enable it quickly? So in Apache, there's a module called mod deflate. Um, this is a simple example, but you can add a directive that's as simple as, it says, uh, for all the MIME types that I'm responding with, gzip their response. So this is saying, for text HTML and text plain and text XML, gzip the response before you send it back to the user. Generally, you have slightly more complicated rules for this in production. There's some funky things around like IE6 and some older stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, so if you actually dig through the docs for mod deflate, they'll give you, sorry, uh, what, if you're using, what if you're using an older browser, like IE5, IE6, or whatever. First of all, upgrade your browser. Um, but yeah, so if you look at the, yeah, so you can have a more complex rule that says, gzip my responses except for this particular user agent, and you could say, that would essentially say, don't gzip for IE6. And if you look at the mod deflate docs in particular, they'll give you an example clear as day right there for how to do that. But it's all user agent based. Good question. Um, the same thing in Nginx, but none of you are running Nginx, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, there's a module called HTTP gzip module. Uh, you just gzip on, you have a minimum length. Same deal with the MIME types it can, uh, that it'll compress on the way out. Any questions there? If you're not using mod deflate, go home, turn it on. Like, I just saved you 70% on next month's Amazon hosting bill. Go ahead. I don't know. I mean, my, oh, uh, sorry. The question was, uh, if you just use the really dead simple mod deflate directive I've shown here, what will that do to a user on IE6? Uh, first, it'll be a reminder they need to upgrade their browser. Uh, but second, uh, I don't know what it'll do. So generally speaking, in production, you'd want to, do you have an answer? Yeah. Binary data. So Robert's, Robert's answer is that a user on IE6 would just see the binary gzip data. They wouldn't be able to actually render that JavaScript and see as it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and realistically, that's a very small percentage of people. So, um, But yeah, same deal with Nginx there. Number four. Any questions so far? We're getting to the last couple here. And, and remind me, <laughs> you, yeah, sorry, it's, I'm, not a, I'm not a fast learner. Yeah, sorry, lesson learned. Um, number four, Ian Myers from Findery. 
do not use HD access files. I love that one because he's like shaking his head. You should feel really bad if you're doing this after this, after these next couple slides. So, do not use HD access files. This is kind of Apache specific. How many of you know what an HD access file is? Ooh, a lot of people. How many of you are using them in production? There is totally more than that. I don't buy that at all. But there's a handful. So uh, I don't know why I titled this Don't Bother, but um, so an HD access file is something that you can put in a directory in your document root that basically overrides any of the settings that Apache has for how to serve that particular site. Um, so the process is basically if you have a directory at foo bar baz and it's whatever.php, you can put an HD access file in that baz directory. Apache will always look for it to see if it's there. It'll parse it, read it, apply the settings, and then it crawls back up the entire directory tree and does it for all the directories above it. So ridiculously wasteful. Um, if you actually read the, uh, the Apache documentation for HD access files, they already recommend don't use them in production. It's very really common for like shared hosting if you're on DreamHost or whatever, where you can't control the, the root Apache config, you've got to resort to using HD access files. That's really where I've seen it most commonly. But that's not a cheap process to look for the file, parse it, apply the settings. It's, it's completely wasteful. So you definitely don't want to turn these on in production. Um, my argument is if you know how your server is going to be configured, configure it in your Apache httpd.com for in the virtual host. There's no reason to drop an HD access file and rely on that uh, in your production environment. No, no. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, no. Yeah, what if you're doing a smart URL thing for SEO purposes? So that would be a mod rewrite rule, right? That's, that's what you're using, right? So you could totally define that mod rewrite rule in your httpd.com. You might have to muck around with the rewrite base directive to have it respect where the base is. Um, but if there's a mod rewrite rule that you're relying on now to be in the HD access file, you can totally move it. It might not be an exact one-to-one -one move. There might be some tinkering with it, but you can totally move it. Good question. Here's an example of an Apache virtual host before and after. So I think this is the allow override auth config. So allow override is the directive that controls these kind of per directory settings. If you've got auth config turned on, that's saying allow, you know, allow Apache to go look for HD access files in these directories. So if you've got that turned on, you want to delete that line and replace it with allow override none, which means all that looking for files and parsing those files that Apache does is gone and turned off. You just save yourself a bunch of disk reads uh, during the request lifecycle. Cool? Oh, question, yes. What about when you see allow override all common What happens when you see allow override all common none? I have no idea. That is a messed up. I would expect that you would end up. I don't know what the order of operations is there. That's a busted Apache config. If you see that, you should just get rid of the all and the comma and, and restart Apache and see what happens. It's, it's, it should be fine. If it's not, <laughs> fiddle around with it. Um, yes? I don't know. I've never actually like used it. Sorry. The question was uh, with, yeah, I'm learning. By slide number three, I'm learning. Um, uh, is there a setting, Chris asked, to turn off the recursive nature of HD access files? Let's say you wouldn't want it to scan the root. Yeah. Like you wouldn't want it to scan the root. So yeah. So you could define that at a per directory level. So you could turn it off at the root and you could turn it on at a deeper level directory. Um, which I think then it would only it would only ever crawl back up to that that lowest level directory where you defined it, so it wouldn't crawl back up above that directory. I think so. I think you would control that with the directory directive in the virtual host. Isn't it, isn't it covered the whole tree in case there's like make sure that the whole whatever's getting overwritten is overwriting everything back up? Yeah, screen. isn't so? Kevin asked, isn't it the Kevin case that asked. yeah, isn't it the, isn't it the case that? Uh, uh, it's traversing the tree to, and applying the rules from, I think it applies them from top down, actually. Um, so the most specific rule is what gets applied. This is a moot conversation because you shouldn't be using them anyway. But yes, I, I don't remember the order of operations that it actually applies. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's highest level first and then down. Um, so whatever you override in the, most, in the deepest directory is what will take precedence. 
But don't use Apache HD access files. End of story. Any more questions? I didn't think so. OK. Number three, Ken Mackey from Rock IP Network. Cache all the data that you can. Cache all the data that you can. How many of you are using Memcached right now? How many of you are using Redis? There are like six people that have written. Are, are the rest of you caching stuff? If you have no idea if you're caching any data, raise your hand. One, there's a, there's a handful. OK, good. This is a good, this is a good slide for you. Um, and we'll look at what it actually means. So there's some common tools for caching data uh, from PHP, from Ruby. They're all gen general purpose tools. There's Memcached, there's Redis. Uh, there's APC, which we'll talk about in a little bit, hint, hint. Um, and there's MySQL query cache, which is kind of so-so. Um, but these are the most common things you'll see for caching data uh, in a web application. So why do you want to cache data, and what do, you, what do you cache? The most common use case far and away is if you're going to your database to get back some records from a table, you don't need to go to your database every single time. Those, those records need to be retrieved because they're not really going to change, right? If, you, if you've got some table of countries and cities, that data is really not going to change all that often. So you can go to the database once, grab all the rows you need, and then cache all of it in Memcached or in Redis. It's really about avoiding round trips to your database and avoiding you know, hitting things that are relatively slow and bottlenecks in your application. Uh, so when you get back data like that and you think it's not going to change, cache it. It's going to be ridiculously faster. And it'll be much more. It'll be able to handle much more concurrent requests. Um, so, it's as you might imagine. If I go to my database and I say, "Get me all the cities in the state of Georgia," uh, it's going to go to your database and get out all hundreds of cities in Atlanta or in, in Georgia. Um, if you can get that once and store it to memcached, getting that data out of memory, out of RAM, is a lot faster than going to your database's disk to get it. You'd still have some network overhead, but. If you were to compare getting all the cities in Georgia from MySQL and getting all the cities in Georgia from Memcached, it'll be orders of magnitude faster. Um, Memcached specifically is easy to, you know, it's easy to pool a bunch of servers together and scale it. You can have five or ten or twenty Memcached servers in a big cluster and use them all together. Uh, it's pretty nice. Let's look at some code and we'll look at like another pretty little diagram. Um, this is the most common use case for Memcached. So I have a class called user retriever. I have a method called get user where I pass it my user ID. So I'm building up a key. So in these, in these cache storage engines, you're typically storing a key and a value. So you've got you know, user ID 1, 2, 3, 4, and all the data for that user. So here I'm building a key, which is my method name, uh, and I've concatenated the user ID onto the end of it. So in this function, I'm saying, all right, I'm going to go to cache first and look and see if I've got data for this user. So I'm setting dollar sign user to whatever data I get back from cache, right, for this particular user's cache key. If that get function call, method call, returns false, boolean false, that tells me it doesn't exist in memcached. So then I'm going to go to the database and get all the data for that user, right? That's the expensive part. But then before you return that user's data, you're going to store it in cache. So here I'm going to be saying put for this particular key, so method name with the dash and the user ID, put all that user's data into cache and store it for an hour. It's a number of seconds there. And then I'm going to return it. So I'm user 1234. Your application comes in, looks me up, goes to the database the first time, looks up all my data, and stores it. I come back, I hit some other page. What's going to happen now? It's going to say, oh, I've got a user. I just got it from cache. I don't need to go to my database now. And it's going to just grab the user value and then just straight up return it right here. So you've not gone to your database at all in this case, which is a big win for you. So your database is chilled out now and it's kind of hanging out because you're caching data. It's great. So looking at it in like logical terms, um, normally you've got a couple web servers, right? Those web servers are behind a load balancer, the internet's sitting in front of them. Sorry, I didn't have a cloud diagram picture to use. Um, they're all connected together. You've got a database. So normally, for those of you who are not using caching right now, this is you. Your web servers are going straight to your database to get all kinds of data, and you're totally just blowing it and wasting all kinds of database access because you're not caching. Right? So if you come along and you say, all right, cool, I went to this talk. I'm going to add memcached tonight. 
You go home, you write some code, and you put memcached in front of your database. Now your web servers will go to memcached first. So think of memcached or Redis or whatever you're using as kind of this layer in front of your database. So now your web servers would go there to get their data. If they don't get what they need, they'd be like, all right, I'm going to the database to get what I need. I'm then going to store it in memcached. And then all the subsequent requests just go to cache. That's kind of a kind of looking at it with a picture sort of sort of view. Any questions? I will repeat your question, Kevin. Go ahead, sorry. Um, like on the memcached, you have to have it in your code mm -hmm. telling it to use memcached. Are there general purpose caching mechanisms that would cache query requests without specifically putting it in your code? So Kevin asks. Uh, with memcached, you would normally have to write code to go to cache and then go to your database, like the code I just wrote in the previous slide, right? Um, his question is, are there general purpose things that would do that work for you? Is that, is that right? Um, yes. I've never used them. Do you know if Doctrine does that? You know? You know? I, don't, I don't know. I'm sure there, pro there probably is something that's wrapped up as a layer between, let's say, MySQL and memcached that brokers that for you. I think there's actually... Um, there's a memcached storage engine in MySQL that's relatively recent. That, um, I've never used it, but I've heard good things about it. No, it's, it's actually able to, to do the connecting to memcached for you. I've never used it, but I've, I've heard it's great. Um, I don't know if it's like quite, ready, quite ready for prime time, but it's out there. So that kind of answers your question, sorry. Do I have any thoughts on memcached versus Redis? What a timely question. Uh, we have been using Redis at CrowdTwist as of I don't know, a couple months ago. Um, they're both ridiculously fast. Um, the nice thing about Redis, so Redis implements the memcached protocol. So you could use the memcached extension in PHP to talk directly to Redis. The nice thing that Redis gives you is it gives you persistence. So Redis is able to flush its, its contents to disk every X number of seconds, or not at all. Um, whereas memcached is completely temporary. If you stop it or flush it, all that cache data is gone. Whereas Redis, if you've got something you want to cache and you want it to be a, little, a bit more durable and write to disk, Redis is a great option for that. But in terms of raw performance, I mean, there, I would say they're similar. Someone out there watching this will probably you know, slip my throat for saying that. But they're, they're both ridiculously fast. If you've got problems with performance where memcached is not enough, you've got much bigger problems probably. Are they both free? They are both free, yes. Oh, code igniter, got it. So Jonathan Hill mentioned CodeIgniter has a driver that's able to kind of broker that communication between the database and your cache layer. So that's good to know. Excellent question. So the question is, with memcached, do you have to make code changes uh, to flush the cache at at some particular, under some particular circumstance. Yeah, so right related to the database. Yeah. So it should always be in right. cache. Yeah, so um, yeah, so there's there's actually a delete method available in memcached. So in some cases, yes, you will. For example, if you're caching user-specific data and that user's state has to change for some reason, let's say, in our case, let's say we, uh, we store the user's current number of points if we give that user points for something else, we have to go purge that user's cache for a certain thing um, so that that change is reflected right away to the user. So there are relatively rare times when you want to actually deliberately purge a, a, a value from cache. Uh, and we do plenty of that at CrowdTwist. It's, I have, you know, you, you'll know when you have to do it. If, it's, if that data changes and you want it to be reflected to the user right away, you should purge it. Otherwise, just relying on the normal aging out by time to live is totally sufficient. Does that answer your question? Anyone else on cash? One more? Uh, 
Um, the question is, is there a tool that will go out and test your data to see if it's changed? And it, basically what you're getting at is, will it do the delete and force it to re-update the cache for you? I don't know, probably. I've never used one. I mean, I don't know. I guess I've always been pretty well served by the normal aging out by time to live and the occasional I deliberately need to purge this particular cache item for some reason. Maybe, I don't know. Does anyone know? No, oh, crickets, sorry. It's a good question though. You should write one and put it on GitHub. That's what you should do, that'd be awesome. Clearly there's a need. Anyone else? All right, getting to the end. Number two, uh, Davy Shafiq from Engine Yard. Use a content delivery network. Use a content delivery network. How many of you know what a content delivery network is? A good number of hands. The most number of hands I've seen tonight. Good, this is more important as we get towards, uh, towards the top. Uh, how many of you do not know what a content delivery network is? All right, a handful, good, this is good stuff for you. Go home, put one in place, trust me. So what does a CDN or content delivery network do? Essentially, um, a content delivery network is able to request uh, some resource, uh, an image or some page or whatever, and cache it on some other servers around the world so that, um, for example, my application, if it lives in Atlanta and you live in Seattle, and I have a content delivery network in front of my application for images, uh, it's entirely possible that you might get your images from my site from Seattle or from LA rather than coming all the way to Atlanta for it. We'll look at this in a minute. Um, but a lot of the big names like Akamai and whatnot, cache servers around literally, cache content around literally tens of thousands of servers around the world. Um, so the CDN is able to take some data and cache it for some period of time to save you load and traffic on your servers. So the CDN sits in front of your servers and we'll look at another similar diagram in a minute. But when that user requests content, generally speaking they hit the point of presence or pop that's closest to them and that point of presence, that server from Akamai or what have you, serves back the content you requested rather than coming back to your server. Some common names around this, how many do you use Amazon CloudFront? A handful, Amazon CloudFront's pretty nice. Uh, how many of you use Akamai? I've ever used Akamai, also very common. Um, there's also Edgecast, which we also use at CrowdTwist. There's a number of options for content delivery networks. Let's look at another pretty diagram that maybe clears this up for those of you who this is new to. You've got a couple web servers, you've got a database, right? You've got a load balancer. I did not copy the previous slide, I swear. Uh, I totally did. Uh, you have the internet, right? So I'm a user, I come get an image, uh, in this case an image of a cat in an internet meme thing. Um, normally, that user would come down to your servers, right, to get the image. So your servers would say, all right, I've got a request for catphoto.png, pull it off a disk and serve it back to the user, right? So all the users that want to see your awesome cat meme photo on Reddit have all just blasted your server, right? So if you put a CDN in front of it, this is what it looks like. So something like CloudFront or Akamai comes in here and, and it sits in front of your machines. It's, uh, a CDN typically has what's known as an origin server. So when I come to make a request for this cat photo and CloudFront doesn't have it, so CloudFront will first say, do I have this cat photo cache in my file system? If I don't, CloudFront will actually come and make these requests of your servers to get the cat photo. They'll store it in their own storage, right? And they'll serve it back to you. So the next person that comes through and asks for that cat photo is gonna go to CloudFront, and CloudFront's gonna say, oh, I've got this image, I know about it. I don't need to bother going back to the origin to get it. Um, so it's really about saving those requests and saving all that work from your web servers and offloading it off to another service that is better for the user, it yields a better user experience, and it just makes your life a lot easier not having to serve cat photos all day long, right? Um, oh, I missed the fancy star animation. Sorry, yeah, so you hit CloudFront. Question, go ahead. I don't know why the Harlem Shake is so popular. That's the question. Why is the Harlem Shake so popular? I don't know. We could do it right now if you guys want. Um, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so that is item number two. Any questions up until this point? Anything else you want me to touch on? Are CDNs expensive? 
Um, it depends. It, uh, so CloudFront by Amazon is generally kind of you pay for what you use, which is great. No, not. I mean, for for a big site they can be, but for a big site, something that's a lot of traffic, you might not be using a CloudFront. You might be using an Akamai and you know, kind of a more, dare I say, commercial like enterprise grade service. Um, but if I had, I mean, if I had to guess, like you could put a CDN in front of AtlantaPHP.org and pay pennies a month for it. So, question? When does it come to a point where you need to put it on a CDN? Um, that's one of the first things I do personally. Um, I had a job I started previously when I got there. No content delivery network at all. Really ridiculously slow page load times. I went in and dropped in CloudFront, and we poof saved ourselves 30 plus, maybe 50 plus percent of our web traffic to our servers. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a no-brainer. I don't remember the exact amount, but. I mean, we had a lot of images, a lot of, so you would typically put images, CSS files, JavaScript files, font files, all the stuff that's truly static are things you can easily offload to a content delivery network. It's, it's so cheap. You know, if you've got, an, if you've got enough traffic, it's a total no-brainer. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Because it's so, so, yeah. Yeah, so the, the point was really around when do you know when to add a content delivery network? And I guess my, my response is that it's never, it's, never early, it's never too early really to add a CDN. It's so inexpensive. And you just, you just immediately you add one in and poof, you don't have to worry about all that traffic. You don't have to worry about getting on the front page of Hacker News or Reddit or whatever, right? Like you're just, all that request processing is no longer your problem. You're just completely hands off from it. Maybe, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Robert says Amazon's pricing for CloudFront is about 12, 12 cents a gigabyte, which is ridiculously cheap. Is there another hand? That's true. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so if you go international, that's a huge help. If you're hosting in the U.S. and someone in, you know, China is going to your site, they're going to be hitting an Akamai pop or a CloudFront pop in China, not coming all the way to the U.S. to get it. So it's really about, it's better for your servers, it's better for your users, it's, again, it's just a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, anything static, images, video content, um, CSS, JavaScript, anything that really doesn't change is a great, great candidate for being CDN. And even dynamic stuff can be, if you wanted to cache the homepage of AtlantaPHP.org, you could totally do that. It doesn't change often. Any other questions on CDNs? All right. Up next, go ahead. One more question. One more question. I don't know. Yeah. Are there any lawyers in the house? Any lawyers? The question is. Uh, uh, multiple people are reminding me now. This is great. The question is, when you when data ends up on a content delivery network, who owns it? And the answer is, I have no idea. So I don't know. Yeah, read your terms of service. There you go. That's the lawyer response. <laughs> Whoever reads terms of service, I know. Well, maybe maybe you should. Yes. Go ahead. Well, good. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. So, I mean, I read my I skim them. I would say. Um, anyway, moving on from the legal mumbo jumbo. Number one, are you guys ready? All right. Number one, our old friend and former original founder of Atlanta PHP, uh, Ben Ramsey of Moon Toast. Use APC and set apc.stat to zero. Show of hands if you love Ben's beard. Yes, look at that. It's fantastic, right? Nice work, Ben. Thank you. So use APC and set APC.stat to zero. How many of you are using PHP with APC? Only a couple hands? How many of you are using PHP? <laughs> all right, so I'm assuming all of you. So very few of you are using APC. That's really bad news. 
another thing, you have a lot of work to do tonight, right? CDNs and real path cache. And so now you need to go home and compile APC and put it on your instance, right? So what is APC? APC it stands for the Alternative PHP Cache. Um, it is basically a module, it's an extension to PHP that when a user comes in and requests a page, some PHP code is run, right? Normally, without APC, PHP opens up the file, parses the file, generates the response, and sends back the response. By using something like APC, it, ca it compiles that PHP code into bytecode, and it caches it. So it saves you that parsing and compiling on all your subsequent requests. So this is r huge savings. If you have a high traffic, you know, big performance kind of application, you need to be running APC. It's a total no-brainer. Um, but it keeps a pool of shared memory in Apache. So I think out of the box, it allots like 64 gig or 128 meg, 64 meg or 128 meg of memory. And it just caches all that compiled bytecode into that pool of shared memory so that when the next user comes and hits your home page, you're not parsing and compiling PHP code over and over again. It just knows what to do already because it's cached it. So it saves you all that parsing. Um, it's an absolute must have on highly trafficked sites. It's one of the first things I would ever install. So you, the question is, can you use that in conjunction with other caching me mechanisms? Yes. Um, yes, you can. So APC cache only lives on a per server basis. It's not shared among servers. If you've got 10 web servers, they've all got their own pool of shared memory for APC. So each of your web servers would parse its PHP code and cache it, um, which is good because it's distributed then. Um, so typically, you'd use a memcache or a Redis for a central cache where you'd use APC for a kind of a localized per server cache. You can also store arbitrary values in it, like strings, simple, you know, kind of key value pair type stuff. Um, there's also talk of PHP 5.5 introducing uh, Zen cache into core. Um, I, that's not a final thing yet, I don't think, as of right now. Um, but it could become the case that in PHP 5.5, you no longer need to install something like APC alongside PHP but it'll come with Zen Cache uh, baked in. I don't think Zen Cache stores arbitrary values. You couldn't store like key value pairs in it, which is kind of a bummer, but we'll see. So, so why APC? Again, less response, or less, uh, faster response times for your, your users, happier users, happier servers, less kind of churning through PHP code going on. Uh, and it's also really good to cache data in it, things like config files, if you're opening up, uh, I don't know, a PHP file, like an array in a PHP file, or parsing like an INI file or an XML file, and you're doing that on every request, parse it once and just store it in APC, and just save yourself that repetitive parsing. So use the, use the user value storage. It's super helpful for things that can be cached across web servers. So the most important setting in APC, in my opinion, for production is a setting called apc.stat. That setting is defaulted to one by default. That setting basically says, uh, if it's turned on, it will go to disk on every request and see if the file on disk differs from what it previously cached in that shared pool of memory. And it will then basically ignore its cache, reparse the file if it's changed, and recache the data. In production, like how many of you edit your files in production? Are you serious? Okay, well you shouldn't be doing that. I, that's slide number zero, which I left out. Do not edit your stuff in production. So this would totally not work for you. If you turn this to zero, you'd be like, I don't see my changes. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, right. so yeah. Are you using source code control by chance to get? Yeah, we use a version Okay, okay, at least you got that. Not, not works on yeah. yeah, yeah, it's totally fair. Yeah, like, I mean, th fair. for WordPress, you like, you it, stuff yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to put something of reasonable amount of performance and traffic in production, you would you turn this off. If you're running WordPress and your site gets 100 hits a month, then you don't care, right? So maybe you don't. Yeah, you can put off this homework for a couple of weeks, right? Um, so yeah, so this setting, uh, when it's on, forces APC to compare what's on disk to what's in uh, to what's in shared memory. Good question. We're going to get to that. If you do a, when you do a build of your code. How do you purge that cache? Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So your code should change relatively infrequently in production, right? You're not pushing out code all the time, like maybe once a day or whatever. Um, 
But when you do push out code, if you have this setting turned off, you need to clear your APC cache. Um, and you can do that in two ways, which uh, uh, was in my notes in the last slide. So there, you can do one of two things to clear your APC cache. You can restart Apache or restart PHP, FPM, whatever you're running, and that will basically dump out that pool of shared memory, empty it out, and everything will recache again. Personally, I tend to restart Apache after I do a build. Um, there's also a, a function called APC clear cache, I believe, and you can either pass an argument to it. That argument, if you give it no argument, it'll just clear everything. You can give it opcode or I think user, and it'll clear either the opcode cache or the user, the user cache. Um, yeah, so, but if, you, if you're gonna call that function, you have to call it from the web server, which means you need to make a request of your cluster of machines and let it run that function in Apache so it can access that shared pool of memory. So yeah, so bounce Apache, that's the easy way. If you absolutely can't afford the Apache bounce, run the APC clear cache function and that'll take care of it. Um, so turning that stat value off, saving yourself that disk operation, huge savings. I've seen like 20% increases in performance with that setting turned off. Uh, it's a major, major performance uh, boost under high traffic. That's all I've got. Uh, we've covered a ton of stuff today. Again, I mean, these are not things somebody like taught me. These are things I've learned over the last 12 to 14 years. Um, these are just the most helpful things that have really saved me uh, in high traffic, high, high uh, performance, high scalability applications. Um, you guys are probably learning and already know things to have another list of 10 or 20 or 30 things here. So it's really important that as you learn those things, you kind of speak about them and talk about them and share them with the community on a forum or come give a talk at Atlanta PHP or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's what I got. All my contact info is there. Uh, any questions? You guys got a lot of questions about during it, so that's good. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.